evening and welcome to the second session of our spring term money webinar series by the Institute of, of International Monetary Research in collaboration with the Vincent Center for the Public Understanding of Economics and Entrepreneurship at the University of Buckingham. I'm Juan Castañeda, director of the IMR, and today we'll be hosting Professor Charles Guhart. Charles Guhart was trained as an economist at Cambridge as an undergraduate student and at Harvard as a PhD student. He then entered into a career that alternated between academia, first in Cambridge and then at the LSE, and work in the official sector, mostly in the Bank of England. Indeed, uh, Charles was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee between 1997 and 2000. He has worked throughout as a specialist monetary economist, focusing on policy issues, monetary policy issues, and on financial regulation, both as an academic and in the Bank of England. He uh, advised uh, Hong Kong on the link in 1983, and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand on inflation targetry in 1988. As he puts it himself, uh, he has written more books and articles on these subjects throughout the last uh, 50 or 60 years than any same person would want to read. He's also a member of the IMR's Academic Advisory Council, and Charles has very kindly collaborated with us in numerous occasions. He has uh, given our 2016 public lecture and he has contributed to our annual uh, conference and other events several times. Today, we will discuss, does the government debt accumulated by central banks since March 2020 matter? Could it just be removed from the central bank's uh, balance sheet? After which, we allow time for Q&A with viewers at home. Thank you very much, Juan, for your kind introduction. Uh, central bank balance sheets are now bigger relative to GDP or to the available overall money stock than they have ever been in history. And I want to start by going back to discuss how we got here before I go on to the issue about where we go from here as we move from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening and what all that means. Now, how did we get here? Well, it really started with the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers uh, in September uh, 2008. That was quite largely unexpected, and it led to a panic because people didn't quite know who else might go bankrupt, and they didn't know quite who else might be in difficulty. So the banks ceased to be prepared to lend to each other. Everybody hoarded cash. Um, and those who had uh, borrowed in order to maintain their cash reserves found themselves in great difficulty. There was a liquidity panic. Now, under those circumstances, what happened was that the Fed absolutely correctly introduced a major exercise of expanding its basic assets through open market operations, uh, assets by buying government debt or government guaranteed mortgages uh, through the GSEs, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and so on. Um, and that actually worked extremely well, but it did have a problem attached to it and that was that the Fed intentionally and consciously increased the cash reserve base, or the liquidity, if you like, uh, of the banking system so much uh, that interest rates began to drop rapidly, nominal interest rates, towards zero. And at that time, uh, in the late autumn of 2008, uh, the Federal Reserve System, the FOMC, Financial uh, Open Market Committee, uh, didn't actually want interest rates to drop to zero. So how could they maintain interest rates at the level that they wanted, uh, while at the same time increasing the availability of liquidity enormously? Now, they resolved that particular problem uh, by offering to pay interest uh, on bank reserves held with themselves uh, at the Fed, I-O-E-R as it's known, interest on excess reserves. Um, and that actually changed the structure of the way money markets worked, and it changed the structure of the way that the Fed uh, affected interest rates. 
because previously uh, the interest rate on bank reserves at the Fed had been zero. And since interest rates are another uh, almost equally liquid assets, like treasury bills were above zero, uh, banks on the whole tried to keep about as few reserves with the Fed as they possibly could. Now, suddenly, uh, reserves were renew remunerated and were remunerated at a level that was not far distant from uh, near liquid assets like short dated treasury bills. And this changed uh, entirely uh, the way that uh, or the amount of reserves that the bank want banks wanted to keep uh, because they were more liquid, had almost as high an interest rate um, and had other uh, regulatory advantages over uh, near liquid assets. So suddenly the commercial bank's desire for reserves uh, changed really uh, quite um, uh, 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 dramatically. And indeed, uh, commercial bank reserves at the Fed have increased by well over a hundred times uh, since the IOER was introduced. It also, of course, changed the way that the Fed operated. Now to change interest rates, it just effectively changes the interest rate that it offers on IOER, rather than having to do it through open market operations, uh, changing the available amount of reserves through its market operations, uh, raising, making, uh, making sales in order to make reserves tighter under the old uh, channel system. Now that had a number of uh, immediate consequences. One of the consequences uh, was that those monetarists who believed that the key variable within the system uh, was the monetary base, which effectively the cash reserves opened to the Federal Reserve System, uh, thought in 2008, 2009, um, that this might well lead uh, to a massive increase in inflation. And of course they were wrong. They were wrong because there had been this massive structural change uh, to, that influenced the demand for reserves. Uh, and it meant that the ratio of deposits to reserves that commercial banks would want to hold ceased to be relatively predictable and varied all over the place, which effectively meant that the standard money multiplier model, which uh, in fact is not a model, it's, it's an identity in practice, uh, ceased to be of any use uh, whatsoever as a means of trying to um, uh, identify and estimate what was likely to happen to the, uh, to the broader <coughs> um, monetary um, aggregates. Um, now, in dealing with the liquidity problem that followed after the Lehman uh, bankruptcy, uh, it worked to treat. It did very well and it was critical uh, in bringing us out of the great financial crisis. It was copied by the Bank of England and indeed was copied by most major central banks around the world. And it has worked to treat uh, whenever we got a subsequent um, liquidity panic. And we've had a few. Uh, there was a liquidity panic uh, in March 2020 after the onset of COVID. Um, and there was a short run crisis in the treasury uh, debt market uh, in the market for treasuries in the United States uh, a following year in 2021. And in both cases, uh, quantitative easing uh, was reintroduced and effectively did very well and did what it was required to do. When there was a, a panic about the availability uh, of, of cash, of currency, uh, then QE uh, works brilliantly. However, uh, QE was, in, was introduced and maintained not only as a crisis mechanism for the de dealing with liquidity panics, which it did very well, but it was used on a, a much more regular basis. Uh, in many cases, continuously 
uh, and increased throughout at times when there was no such uh, liquidity panic. It was used as a general new instrument of monetary policy uh, to uh, allow for expansion at a time when the effective lower bound to nominal interest rates uh, meant that the normal instrument of monetary policy uh, was no longer fully operational. Uh, and this had a number of effects. Uh, it lowered long rates somewhat. The best estimate of the effect of QE in long rates is I think that it lowered long rates by about 75 basis points for other, from what otherwise would have happened. Uh, it of course in, uh, enhanced liquidity generally throughout uh, and therefore reduced the premium on safe assets and encouraged uh, those who could get less uh, lower interest rates on the safer assets uh, to search for yield and go into riskier assets. Um, and I think had some impact uh, on the fact that asset prices in general uh, have been remarkably historically high uh, over the last few years, uh, remaining so indeed uh, today. Uh, furthermore, um, since the central bank is part of the public sector, what the central bank was doing was swapping site assets, i.e. Uh, the reserves that the commercial banks could hold, for much more longer dated assets and was therefore vastly reducing uh, the duration uh, of the public set of the pub of the public debt uh, overall. Um, and in many ways, uh, this I think has been quite a disaster uh, because interest rates have been historically at an all time low. And if you think that there is any possibility whatsoever that interest rates might go back to much more normal levels, or even that we might have inflationary pressure, which require nominal interest rates to go well above uh, the normal sort of historical level, uh, then having uh, the duration of your debt uh, very short, which is what QE effectively has done, uh, is a disaster because what you should do when interest rates are exceptionally historically low is build in, fix in the advantage of that for the longest possible foreseeable future. Instead, what QE did was effectively to make the impact on the public sector's debt ratio and uh, debt service problems uh, much, much worse and immediately much worse uh, as interest rates rise, which is going to mean that uh, when interest rates have to rise to deal with our present inflationary problems, uh, what is going to happen uh, is that ministers of finance will become much more immediately at odds uh, with central bankers uh, because the increase in interest rates uh, is going to have an immediate effect uh, on uh, their, um, uh, their financial position and the debt service ratio and the interest payments that have to be made on that uh, as a function of, um, as, a, as a ratio to GDP. It will, of course, also vastly reduce uh, the profitability uh, of the banks, uh, central banks, uh, and maybe make them uh, loss making. Uh, which has a number of political disadvantages, uh, even if, as has been shown in many Latin American countries, central banks can go on operating even when they have a, uh, uh, a negative net worth. Let me just spend a very quick minute about the issue about can't we just cancel the debt uh, that the central banks hold? And the answer is yes, of course we could, but remember a balance sheet has to balance. And if you cancel uh, the debt held by the central banks, 
what equivalently then happens to the balance sheet is the, the net worth of the central bank then simply totally heads massively downwards and the central bank becomes a huge net debtor. Uh, and that would mean that uh, the credibility of the central bank uh, would be at risk if the, the net if the net loss position of the central bank became large enough, as my colleague and friend Willem Boiter has frequently pointed out, um, it actually couldn't work anyhow. And in practice, um, no central banker at all would ever willingly uh, accept a situation in which the assets it held were simply cancelled and its uh, financial position uh, ceased to be a very small capital surplus and became an absolutely huge capital deficit. Now, partly because and the situation has changed dramatically in the course of the last uh, couple of years from a situation in which uh, inflation has been lower than target for quite a number of years to one in which inflation has spiked and is now well over target, the central banks are moving towards normalization, which means that they're moving from quantitative easing uh, to quantitative tightening. Uh, now, initially, I thought that that would be done almost entirely by allowing the assets, government debt held by the central banks to run off as they matured, it now looks as if the central banks, Bank of England, uh, the Fed, may actually be prepared to speed the process up by having uh, a number of pre-arranged, pre-announced sales. Uh, they can't just go into the market and sell without any warning, uh, because if they did, it would panic the market. So that the idea would be that in addition to not maturing, not reinvesting the maturing uh, debt, uh, they might to some extent uh, actually undertake uh, these prearranged sales. Now, what is the speed with which uh, the, um, this normalization might, um, might occur? Uh, what is the rate at which they will run down their, um, uh, their accumulated uh, holdings of government debt? And what are the implications? And the answer is we don't yet really know. It's still being worked out, it's still to be determined. Um, and uh, what are the implications? Um, again, uh, the true answer is we don't really know. And yet another thing that we don't really know is what is the end point which is what under the new arrangement of IOER uh, uh, and setting interest rates on reserves, what is the total amount uh, of uh, assets that the central bank might hold? What is the total amount of reserves that the commercial banks might want to hold in an IOER world rather than the old world of paying zero interest on reserves. And again, that to some large extent uh, remains uh, to be seen. So let me go through some of the implications. Um, the first one uh, is that long-term interest rates uh, will rise faster and more uh, than they otherwise would do. Uh, how much? Well, it almost certainly reversed to 75 basis points. Uh, but I must confess to a slight concern uh, that it might do more than that, uh, which is that the um, scale uh, of the public sector deficits are still so large uh, that the amount that has to be raised in set sales uh, every year remains very considerable. Add to that uh, the fact that the central banks will be either not reinvesting or actually making prearranged sales, and you've got an even larger amount 
uh, of new issues uh, that have to be made. Now, in the last few years, uh, the central banks uh, have actually uh, uh, bought, uh, in most cases, well more than 50%, in some cases, almost near to 100% uh, of what has had to be sold by the debt management offices. Add to that the increase in gilt purchases at various institutions like pension funds and banks more or less have to do. And you can see that the uh, gilt market, the treasury market in the US, uh, has been more or less completely matched by either the central bank or by quasi forced buyers. Now, if you're going to have a sudden shift from that position to one in which uh, there's suddenly a huge increase in the amount of debt to be issued, uh, and the central bank is reversing from being a buyer to a seller, uh, who's going to jump in um, and take its place? Well, one of the issues, though I think this is more for the US uh, and the Fed than for the Bank of England uh, or the ECB, uh, is that you might think the foreigners would be prepared to do this. <clears throat> but uh, the foreigners will take note uh, of the sanctions imposed uh, on Russia, uh, that the US is in the position effectively to say, I'm afraid uh, I, I've shut your access to the gilt market up. And I don't see the Chinese being prepared to buy more uh, US debt. And it must cast a slight uh, concern among others, even those who are long-term allies of the US uh, whether you want to put all your eggs into the treasury basket in the US. So it may well be that the increase, uh, given the new conjuncture in long-term interest rates will be considerably more uh, than reversing the old 75 basis points, uh, which we now tend to think was the effect uh, on the way down that on the way up, uh, it could be considerably greater. Um, but I don't know. Uh, and I don't think that anybody else knows. Uh, so to some extent, I think that the uh, quantitative easing would be better done. Uh, I think the phrase is by using stepping stones over the river, taking it gradually and seeing how the market reacts rather than by having a sort of massive great pre-arranged plan, which you feel forced to mean and adhere to uh, when you don't exactly know what, 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 what's coming. And again, as I said, nobody really knows what the optimal amount of reserves and therefore of assets in the central bank's balance sheets ought to be uh, when we reach our ultimate uh, equilibrium. Uh, so there's a whole, deal of uncertainty uh, about the speed of QT, about the effect of QT, and about the, the end point. Um, and this will be uh, an interesting issue uh, over the course of the next few months. Um, despite the dangers, I think it's absolutely right, not only to end QE, uh, but to reverse it. Uh, and certainly it is right uh, not to reinvest maturing uh, debt that they hold on their books, but the quantity of sales, the speed with which you tighten, uh, and what the end point might be, uh, remain very much uh, subjects to be determined, uh, and it will be fascinating uh, to see how we get on with that. So. Um, with this rather sort of position of saying um, I, that I don't quite know what the future is going to bring, and it will be a very interesting to observe what the future does bring, uh, I think I will leave it at that. Uh, one final word, uh, 
the monetary base monetarists got into difficulty because they didn't understand the important structural changes that had occurred. Uh, it is, uh, a, I think, a useful lesson to all of those, including to some extent myself, who believe that the monetary aggregates are, and their rate of growth are very important, to note that any really major structural changes which influence the demand for those assets have to be taken into consideration uh, by when you look at the rate of growth. And the monetary base monetarists fell flat in their face. Um, it is important uh, for monetarists to keep a weather eye and a close watch on structural changes affecting monetary changes uh, as they develop over time. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's been fascinating and indeed very comprehensive. We have several questions already uh, sent by our audience. Uh, Bank of England uh, look likely to lose money on their QE portfolio over the next four or five years. The amount they will lose depends on the level of the bank rate. So uh, do you think that uh, this may bias uh, the Bank of England's uh, decisions about interest rates in the next few months? The answer to that is no. Uh, and fairly confidently, no. Uh, the um, central banks don't like making losses for political reasons rather than economic reasons, but they are fully aware that their primary objective is to maintain price stability. And I have complete confidence that they will set interest rates in their best efforts to achieve that without worrying about the uh, losses anyhow. Uh, when it comes to the Bank of England and the APF, remember that the losses are borne by the Treasury, not by the Bank of England. So it won't be an influence in the Bank of England, and I don't think that it will be uh, an influence in the US or in any other country. There are many other things which might be more of a concern about raising interest rates, the effect on, on uh, employment, uh, the effect in potential recession, uh, the effect in Europe uh, on uh, fragmentation of interest rates between uh, countries with a stronger uh, fiscal position and those with a weaker fiscal position. But the loss that central banks may uh, have to face uh, on, their, on their asset holdings will not, in my view, be a significant element. Do you then think that this is not going to threat uh, central bank independence? Lots of things are going to threaten central bank independence. Uh, primarily, the concern that the raise in interest rates uh, will have such a, a severe effect uh, on um, uh, the debt interest payments of the minister, ministers of finance. That will. Um, I think that the extent of QE uh, was a mistake, and I think it will lead uh, to um, a greater conflict between the politicians on the one hand and the central bankers on the other. Uh, but this will be primarily because the ministers of finance will blame the central bank for having got them into a position uh, where the debt service ratios are rocketing upwards um, and they feel under great pressure to raise taxes or lower expenditures otherwise. How will the indemnity the Bank of England has with the government operate? It won't be nice for the government to pay up to 0.4% of the GDP per year to the Bank of England for a few years. <laughs> well, and no, indeed, it's not won't be nice. And with hindsight, uh, they will blame the central bank. Uh, but remember, there was no criticism uh, of QE uh, at the time. Uh, remember, during the period in which it, in, inflation was very low and interest rates were coming down, uh, this provided large profits to the ministries of finance, and they thought it was a great idea. Problem is that hindsight is wonderful, uh, but it will, the fact that it's going to lead great to much greater difficulties for ministers of finance 
that QE was undertaken to such a massive extent, it will lead them with the benefit of hindsight to criticize what occurred earlier. But again, all I can say is they should have known beforehand, they should have raised the concern about what might happen if interest rates had to rise as they now will. Thank you, Charles. Uh, recent evidence suggests that uh, the Fed's system reserves held by commercial banks are declining as banks find more profitable investments in loans or higher yielding treasury bonds. This is equivalent to shifting base money into broad money at the time, at the time when inflation is rising. So do you think this is a problem? Yes, indeed. And it will have to be insofar as the broad money uh, increases faster. And this enables uh, consumption uh, to and other expenditures to rise faster, uh, despite the increases in energy prices and so on. It will mean that interest rates have to rise even higher in order to restrain inflation, um, and that will redouble the problems. Suppose interest rates rise sharply to say 5% or even more, then the central bank must pay an interest like uh, this on its enormous cash liabilities. The stockpile of securities acquired by QE operations consists most, mostly of uh, fixed interest uh, government securities, often long term. Even without the government not cancelling the debt, the central bank will have a problem covering the interest cost uh, to the banks. Do you have any comment on it? Is there not a, a risk that the state will stop on banks' cash reserves? Oh, absolutely. Um, but if it did so, uh, it would represent, in effect, a tax on the banks. And what you would do, uh, if you wanted to uh, go down that road, uh, and some people have advocated it, indeed, from time to time, I've played with this idea myself, is that what you do is that you, um, uh, you leave the marginal uh, interest rate uh, as IOER as you want, but that you tell the banks that you're going to pay on their, uh, say, first, however many, um, well, hundreds of millions of billions of pounds of reserves, you're going to pay zero. Now, it, that in practice is the equivalent of a tax on the banks, uh, and such a tax on the banks. Uh, may be actually quite advantageous uh, and desirable by chancellors of the Exchequer. I think that there, however, there are problems in that. And that is that if there is that kind of tax on the banks, it would make a shift of financial intermediation uh, out of the banking system into near banks more likely. Uh, it would also mean, I think, that if the UK banks were taxed in this way, uh, there would be a shift of financial intermediation out of London uh, into other uh, financial centers abroad. Uh, so I think that the question that um, one should then take straight ahead is under the present circumstances, uh, do you want to tax the banks? Uh, it would also have the impact uh, that the spread between the deposit rate and the lending rate would rise quite sharply. Uh, that again would be a factor shifting financial intermediation out of the banks into the near banks. Um, and it would make uh, banking less attractive. Now, given the difficulties which are likely to occur ahead, it may well be uh, that the politicians uh, may think that a tax on the banks uh, is desirable. Um, but again, let me go back in a bit to the question of, this, of the point that I was raising about sort of monetarism more generally, which you've got to think about structural issues. And the question that I would have would be if the tax is sufficient, could it mean that near bank, non-bank financial intermediaries uh, would take over quite a lot of the roles that the banking system now has? And would that mean that the relationship between broad money uh, 
um, and GDP might become less or less less uh, less sta stable uh, than it has been in the past. I think it's a question that one would have to ask oneself. Thank you, thank you, Charles. Um, uh, going back to one of your comments about uh, the the the. Um, uh, um, expected uh, sales by some central banks, indeed the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, in the next few months, uh, so-called uh, uh, quantitative uh, tightening. Um, what I don't see in the, the, the communications from the Bank of England in particular is that uh, they don't seem to pay attention to the effects of these sales on the amount of money in the economy, on monetary growth broadly defined, uh, in a time when, as you know, uh, monetary growth is decelerating in the UK and quite sharply. So my fear is that uh, we may end up, uh, end up having too little money in the economy. Uh, I know there is the opposite scenario as the one we have seen in the last two years, but I'm, I don't see this as, as a concern at all yes. by the Bank of England. I don't think it has been raised in the Bank of England, but if you put a tax on the banks and thereby force them to raise the spread between deposit and lending rates, that this would cause a much sharper reduction uh, in the money supply than you are envisaging in any case. So that if you're worried about too sharp a reduction, uh, a tax on the bank's reserves, uh, intramarginal reserves, would I think be uh, extremely um, uh, stupid to, uh, to undertake. Um, how much would it, assuming that there is no tax, uh, how much um, uh, will quantitative tightening uh, reduce the rate of growth of the broad money supply? Um, the, here we get back to the question of what is the sort of norm, normality that the commercial banks want anyhow? Um, and again, nobody really quite knows that. The general belief at the moment, I think, is that the commercial banks hold a great deal more in the way of reserves at their central bank than they feel that they really need. And they have done this for a number of reasons because it's nicer to do this than hold uh, treasury bills and so on and so on. Now, under those circumstances, uh, if there is a reasonably strong demand for loans, and if longer term interest rates go up, as they will, uh, then I think it is quite possible uh, that the commercial banks could allow their uh, reserve ratio to fall quite a lot, uh, while at the same time uh, expanding their other assets in the form of loans um, and other investments. But again, uh, these are very uncertain, um, and uh, it, uh, it depends on, on a lot of other considerations, uh, such as what is happening uh, to the economy more generally. Are we going to head into a recession, uh, or, uh, and et, et cetera, et cetera. And there are an awful lot of unknowns uh, in this particular juncture which I think is one of the reasons why I would hope that uh, the central banks can take quantitative tightening uh, relatively gradually and, and adjust their sales uh, according to how that affects the markets. Mm. Yeah, yeah. My fear, uh, Charles, is that I, I don't think they, they take it into consideration uh, that the potential effects of the of quantitative tightening in, in monetary growth in the next few months but i may be i may be wrong i don't think they took it uh, into consideration when they applied massive qe in 2020 and 2021 and i don't think they will do it now but but again i, I really don't know <laughs> it's just uh, a hypothesis well you're absolutely right and central bank central banks have more or less glorified uh, in taking no notice of the monetary aggregates whatsoever um, and, um, and I think that that has been and will remain uh, a mistake. Um, as you know, my, my particular position is that there are very strong, there were very strong disinflationary pressures uh, beyond the monetary ones uh, 
for the 30 years up to 2019, and this is now going to change. Um, but I certainly accept that looking at the monetary aggregates ought to be, uh, particularly the broad monetary aggregates. And I think looking at the monetary base, given the structural changes, was a mistake. Uh, and a severe one, and it actually did monetarism a lot of harm. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, there should be a greater concern about looking at the broad monetary aggregates. But even there, I think that you've got to look at what are the structural changes affecting the demand for the broad monetary aggregates. Thank you, Charles. Um, uh, going back to, your, to one of the points in your presentation, about the possibility to write off the, the debt of the government uh, held by the Bank of England, for example. Um, what would you say to those claiming that it doesn't really matter uh, to run a monetary policy you know, by a central bank uh, with uh, negative equity? The, it's certainly the case that you can run a central bank uh, with, a, with a system where it has a net loss position, and that has happened quite frequently in Latin America. Uh, my great friend and colleague who last died about, I think it was about 12 years ago, Max Fry, uh, did a lot of work on this. And my colleague Willem Boiter has done quite a lot of work on this. Um, what Willem and Max showed was if you're running a, a small deficit, small loss position, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but if your loss position becomes massive, uh, the, the, the credibility of the central bank um, really would decline really quite considerably. And Willem has done some work, which I haven't really gone through because I thought it was so implausible, uh, not his work, uh, but the actual event uh, of that a central bank could, if it became hugely uh, insolvent, uh, could lose credibility and the ability to control the system. But uh, you would have to go a long way uh, into having the central bank in a massive loss position before that actually comes into practice. Um, I'm afraid I put that under the, under the heading of things I would study uh, if and when such an un, un, implausible event actually took, took place. And if you really want to follow that up, go and talk to Willem, not to me. <laughs> we will do, we will do. Uh, thank you very much, Charles. We have taken enough of your time. You've been very kind and patient and uh, you have uh, uh, um, uh, given an, an extraordinary presentation, really fascinating on a really challenging uh, topic. I appreciate it. And uh, also you have taken the time to answer the questions from our audience. So thank you very much again uh, for your time. I look forward to, to having you with us again uh, in the future. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. And thank you uh, to all our viewers from home. There will be another uh, webinar uh, next week. That will be the, the, the last in our uh, webinar series in the spring and more to come later on in the year. Thank you all very much.